morning, River Church. Welcome to those uh, here in the sanctuary and those online. We're going to start our service. Uh, before that, we're going to have a little time of singing, a little time of prayer, and then we'll start the service right after that. I'd like to start this morning with a, a reading out of the book of Psalms. This is from Psalm 89. It says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. And the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord. Your faithfulness also in the assembly, in the assembly of the saints. This is the assembly of the saints this morning. Now, sometimes we don't necessarily feel like saints, but uh, God sees us as his children. And uh, we're here to worship him this morning. So let's praise him together today. Let's come now, found.
Lord, that maybe when others have let us down, that we were quick to forgive. Lord, we ask your guidance, Lord, for that. When the world tends to take us away from you, Lord, like the, like the hymn, we're prone to wander, our hearts are prone to wander from you, Lord. By your spirit, you can, you can deliver us from the evils of this world. You give life. 
Yeah. 
having to do anything to get it. Let's think about this morning, the grace that we receive from you and the grace that we need to give each other each and every day. Think about how our world would change if we just stopped and paused and thought about that each and every day. And we provided each other the grace in our families and our communities based on the love that you have for us. Let's pray about that this morning and we can carry that in our hearts. You've given us grace, Lord. Let us give grace to each other each and every day. Let us love each other like you love us. Like Jesus loved the church. We ask you this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Morning, River Church. Morning online. How's everyone doing this morning? I'm Kevin Thompson. I forgot to introduce myself last week. I, I, I've been doing this so much, I forget these things, like the process. So my wife reminded me to do that today. Um, Ted and I have been here since the start of the church. We helped plant the church. So we've run different ministries. And I'm also one of the elders along with Josh and Todd. So this morning, it's really kind of just reminding you of a couple things, housekeeping things at the end. We've seen bigger crowds the last two weeks, which is awesome. Thank you guys for coming out. So just remember at the end, just try to wipe down your pews and everything and make sure that the garbage gets into the garbage so that we can clean up uh, when everybody's done. Just make sure all that happens before you leave. Um, one thing that we mentioned last week, the updated church center app. So again, if you didn't do this last week, take out your phones. I give everybody a couple seconds online too. So the new app, the Church Center app, Josh updated it. So at the very bottom, there's a menu. It says home and it says Sunday. So if you click Sunday, it'll give you an option to either open the app in, it, in the website or it'll give you the option to open it in the Bible app. So you can go right to the Bible app now and it'll have all the information you need for a Sunday service. There's also a couple other links there. It's events. So if you want to know what's going on at the church, we have a couple things going on, which I'm going to mention in a, in a minute or two. If you want to sign up for an event, you just click one of those images and it'll bring you right to the form and you can sign up. So that'll be great if you guys can do that. And there's also the ability to give right there too. So if you're not giving online and you're forgetting when you come to church, oh, I forgot my check. You can just click the, click the give link and it'll take you right to the option to, to fill out that form and give online. So a couple things coming up this Saturday. It's moving day for the church. We got to move all of our stuff out of the storage units in Plainfield that we have. And then we're going to move everything into the church, wherever it goes, or into the storage that we now have at the church. So we have storage at the church. We don't have to store anything in storage units anymore. We have this humongous closet on the, on the backside of the church. So we can just put stuff in there if it's not being used at the moment. But we did, yesterday we went to the storage units actually and brought the soundboard down and but I connected all that yesterday so there's there's progress being made at the church if you haven't swung by recently swing by we actually have carpet in places that we didn't have carpet things are pretty much all painted which is awesome and it's pretty much there we have real heat instead of temporary heat so everything's pretty progressing pretty well just got to get doors <laughs> so so that's one of the things we're waiting on but the progress is being made and it's amazing and we're just so blessed to have, have gotten this far. I mean, who's crazy enough to build a church in a pandemic? We are, that's us, that's River Church. So, so that's gonna happen Saturday. So really what we need is a bunch of people to show up at our storage units in Plainfield at about nine o'clock. 
with trucks so we can move everything out of there and get everything down to the church. If you have a trailer, that would be great. Bring that too, and we can stuff things in the trailer. But the whole idea is to have enough people there so it won't take that long, and then we'll unload everything in an organized fashion into the church or into the storage area. So we'll have people there that will organize all that. I'll be there. I think Todd's going to be there. So we'll, we'll make sure that there's still going to be work going on in the building on Saturday, but we really need a crew to, to help with moving everything. So that would be awesome if people could show up on Saturday to do that. The more people we have, faster it goes. All right, so then... A couple weeks after that, on March 21st, right after church, our youth group is going to Yagu Valley to go snow tubing. So it's the, the first real big event that the youth group has had to go out and do something. I think since they went camping in September, I think it's the first time that they've actually been able to do something together as a group like this. So it's an awesome thing. They did it last year. They had a lot of fun. Um, so sign up for that. Again, it's one of the links on the app. If you just click that, it, you can sign up for it. The form is up and running. So we are, you have the ability to sign up for that too as well. All right, I'll pray over Josh as he comes up. Lord, we're so grateful to be here this morning in your presence. We've worshiped, we fellowshiped a little bit. Now it's time to hear your word, the word that you put on Josh's heart. It was very revealing last week uh, to hear Josh it's expressed that some of the things that he struggles with and that he's tried to overcome and that as we continue to grow and mature in our faith, this is what it's called evolution of our faith, right, Lord? When you, when you bring us to a point where we just are like, can we do this? Am I, am, am I the one to do this? And you start having us be really introspective and asking those questions. So as it gives us the message today, let it pour into our heart, Lord. We ask you this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I appreciate Kevin's <clears throat> update. Uh, one thing that I'm probably in the best position to give as far as just another quick where we're at in the building process update is you may, you probably don't know this, but it took us six months to line up the financing, to line up the plans and the permits to build. So from January of last year until June 26th was the day that we closed on our loan. It was six months of hard work just to do all of like the administrative stuff that we had to do. Uh, it was so difficult, it was so trying. Um, the Lord used that time powerfully in my life, but long story short, as I made myself this promise that if we ever get to like actually start building the church, I will never complain about anything ever again because the actual work of construction will be easy compared to the permits, the plans, and the financing. And of course, that's a promise that I've broken many times um, because the work of, we've now spent nine months actively building the church. And as we look at March tomorrow is the month of March, obviously we're hoping to be in by the first week in April. Um, it's going to be very difficult the month of March, not, not because of, there are some important tasks that have to happen, but the good news is we have four weeks to accomplish them is that now we're back into an administrative process where various town organizations and entities have to come and give approval. And so just to be able to get the certificate of occupancy, we have to have at least three different sign-offs from different town organizations. And so we've gone from the world, we're transitioning from the world of contractors who like to move quickly and get stuff done so they can get their checks back into the world of I don't want to say politics, but it's, it's, a different, it's a different vibe. And it moves slower. And, it, and personally, I found the six months of the administrative stuff to be more challenging than the nine months of frustrating, I guess is the right word, than the nine months of, of construction. And so that's really where we need to focus our prayers this month as March is upon us, that the Lord would continue to give us favor with the town, uh, that we would be able to get people on the property to get their approval, um, so that we'll be able to use the building legally by Easter. Uh, we, we will, we're just gonna keep, I covet your prayers in that regard. That's an update that's probably, I'm the best one to give that update because I'm the one most involved in that kind of stuff. Um, but yes, continue praying for safety and progress on the site, but we're back in the hands of administrators and town officials, and so please pray that that goes well. We have done everything well. We have nothing to hide about the building. Everything is fit and trim and perfect, uh, but it is not done yet, and so we'll see how the town signs off on that. So I appreciate your prayers there. Last week, I introduced uh, a sermon that is, or a sermon series that is based on one verse, which is Luke chapter 2, verse 52, which says that Jesus grew in wisdom, and we looked at that last week, in stature, we're going to look at that this week, 
in favor with God and in favor with men. And the, I, I love looking at this verse, as, as I mentioned last week, because I feel personally that I can't change fast enough, that the Lord is calling me to grow in a number of different areas in my own personal life. I feel that the Lord has the same hope and expectation and desire for River Church, that we would grow quickly. We've been blessed with a tremendous tool and uh, kind of like handing the keys to your teenage son or daughter, uh, we understand that we need them. As important as it is that they know how to operate the vehicle safely, we're looking for someone who can make good decisions, right? We're looking for maturity. And as we have you know, parented children, uh, we're all at different phases in that, you know it's not something that we can impose upon them that it is something that we need to see develop. We create the environment, but they have to make the decisions of faith to lean into our training and actually grow up. Yes, they need to know how to operate a car safely, but we're more worried about their thinking process than we are. We know that they will learn the mechanics of driving, but will they ever grow up? <laughs> Sometimes we despair. This is how our Heavenly Father feels towards me, Personally, this is how our Heavenly Father feels towards the church. He's literally handing us the keys to the best new tool any of us have ever had for evangelism and discipleship. Will we step into maturity? Will we grow up? And when we look to Jesus, we see that he grew in wisdom. He grew in stature. He grew in favor with God and with men. Quick warning for this sermon. Um, we're gonna be talking my particular interpretation of Jesus growing in stature, obviously it meant that the, the text means he physically grew up. He got taller, he got stronger, he went from a boy through puberty and he turned into a man. Obviously it means that. Uh, however, I also believe it means a lot more because when you look at the New Testament and in the Bible in general, there's not a whole lot of guidance about growing physically but there's a lot of guidance about how we are to, we have bodies and there is a theology of having a physical body. And that's kind of where we're gonna be going this morning. Here's my warning. Because we are going to be looking at the scripture about the use and the intent and the purposes of our physical bodies, this sermon may feel more personal than the average sermon. I don't know that I've ever really just preached about the gift that is our physical bodies and how the Lord expects us to manage our bodies, how he has blessed us with bodies and what that means. And so um, some of you I know really, really well. Some of you I hardly know at all. I'm just asking you to please listen to the word of God, even though it might feel a little pinchy at times. I'm not singling, if I'm singling anybody out, it's me. I'm not, I'm not singling any particular individual out, but I think there's the possibility as, as I preach about our bodies that um, this, we might feel like the whole sermon is an application and it might be a little squishy, a little uncomfortable, uh, which is great. That's the voice of the Holy Spirit moving through his word. It, it's not Josh trying to be mean to anybody, although I love being mean to people so I can see why you would think that. That's, that's the warning. Okay, let's preach about growing in stature. I introduced the theme verse, Luke 2, verse 52. I've already quoted it. Uh, let's ask this question. In the eyes of biblical wisdom, in the eyes of our Heavenly Father, who gave us our bodies, right? He could have just created humans as incorporeal spirits. That's what God is. Like if we were really created in the image of God, we wouldn't necessarily need a physical body because God doesn't have one. So obviously he has a plan, he has a purpose, he has an intent. He gave us our bodies and we are created in his image. So how much time, how much energy, how much thought should we be putting into the fact that we're physical beings? We know that we're spiritual beings and emotional beings, but we're also physical beings. How much time should we prioritize towards focusing on growing in stature, of developing our bodies? Uh, the verse that probably gives us the most guidance in this regard is found in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, which says, Paul writes, for the training of the body 
has a limited benefit, but godliness is beneficial in every way since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. If I were to summarize just in three words, what Paul is saying in this verse, what he's trying to teach is that our inside shapes our outside. That our inside is to have more of our priority, more of our time, more of our attention, more of our care, developing who we are on the inside as people, spiritually, emotionally, our hearts, if you will. It's not that our bodies aren't important, they are, but they come second. Because he says, you know, our, this body that we currently have, if we pour all of our time and energy into, into this physical body, well, it's going to pass away in time. And now we know that in eternity, even as Jesus has a resurrected body, we will also have a resurrected body. We're not going to be incorporeal spirits for eternity, but that's going to be a new body. So this body, yes, we need to take care of it, but it's going to die and and fade away and we will receive a new body from the Lord. But the thing that stays the same, whether we are in this body or in the body to come is who we are. And so Paul is saying, like, let's focus on that. Physical training, physical discipline, physical exercise, the training of the body has a limited benefit. It is beneficial to a point. And the point exactly is the day of our death. At that point, all of our physical training actually means nothing. But everything that we have done to conform our hearts and our minds and our personalities and our characters to the image of Jesus Christ, that part continues to grow throughout eternity. That part is eternal. So uh, whether we want to say 60-40, 70-30, 80-20, but it shouldn't be 50-50, right? So when it comes to how much time do we focus on our bodies, our bodies are given to us by the Lord. He didn't have to give them to us, but he did. They are ours to manage and to train and to take care of. Uh, And we'll talk about why here in a moment. However, more of our time and energy should be focused on having our minds and hearts conformed to the image of Christ. If you think about it this way, we know a lot more about who Jesus was spiritually than we do physically. Think about that. Like we have a picture in our brain probably of what Jesus looks like and scripture gives us a little bit of guidance. Actually, scripture says that he was not much, there was nothing in him that caused us to want to focus on his appearance. He wasn't anything special physically. That's really the only guidance that we have in the Bible. Other than Luke 2.52, we knew he grew up. So the Bible doesn't really emphasize Jesus' physical appearance. Uh, He was probably uh, strong because he worked with his hands. You know, he was probably thin because they didn't have double stuff Oreos. But we're just making stuff up now. We don't really know. So the Bible, but we know a lot about Jesus' character and nature and spiritual development. So we too should be focusing more on our uh, development as a person, being conformed to the image of Jesus in our spirits, um, and then obviously our bodies are important, but not as important. So how much do we focus on our body? 60, 40, 40, 60, 70, 30, somewhere in there, right? Something like that. They're important, but not as important as the inside drives the outside. The inside shapes the outside. Moving on. So how do our physical bodies interact with or engage with or influence spirituality. Another way of saying this is how do our bodies influence decisions of faith? What impact does our physical body have on matters of eternity? What's the relationship there biblically? What's God's perspective on this? Uh, Probably the clearest passage that helps us understand that question is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. So for those of you who haven't are maybe new to church or sermons, most weeks I preach in like a narrative exegetical way. I stick in one passage. I start at the smaller verse and I work my way to the higher verse. Uh, This series I'm actually preaching topically, which means we're taking an idea and we're then looking at different passages that help us illustrate or understand that idea. Both styles of preaching have their merits, but I do want to mention that they're different. And you might be noticing, why is Josh 
bingoing all over the Bible right now. This is why. It's a topical sermon, uh, which is, has its strengths and its merits. Normally, I like to preach through a passage, but this sermon series lends itself to topical, so there is gonna be some turning through your Bible. And why I mention it is because if you're curious about a passage or, or the thought, read the verses before and after. Highly, highly encourage that. So how much do we focus on our body? Paul says in 1 Timothy, ah, 60, 40, 70, 30. Focus on the inside because it drives the outside. How do our bodies actually influence decisions of faith? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. Which says, and I forgot my glasses today, so it takes me a while to find the actual verse. Oh, there it is. <laughs> verse 27. Instead, I discipline my body. Yeah, we know that. Just said that in 1 Timothy. And bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Let me read that again. Paul is saying, the verse before says, therefore I do not run the race of life like one who runs aimlessly. I don't fight, I don't box, I don't punch, like one just beating the air. There's an intentionality to my life because I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Tragically, uh, you may have seen this, it made national headlines. One of my favorite uh, men of God ever, seriously, like top three, top five, uh, Ravi Zacharias recently came out. Uh, he's a, a great theologian, a great apologist. He recently died. Um, very, very influential man of God, written any number of books, incredible intellect. He did not manage his body well, come to find out. And uh, it's made national news. And this verse applies, unfortunately, to Ravi's life that he because he did not manage his body well, a lot of his influence in the kingdom of God is now being called into question. He has, in the eyes of many, and certainly in my own, been, to a certain degree, disqualified. Come to find out, he said a lot of good things, but he didn't do a lot of good things. He mismanaged, his, he was not disciplined. He did not bring himself under strict control. Therefore, after preaching to others, millions, he, he's sort of been disqualified. Uh, and it's very tragic and it's very sad. What Paul is saying here is that our outside, our physical bodies, how do they impact decisions of faith and matters of eternity and spirituality, our own and others? Our outsides illustrate our insides. Our outsides are an illustration of our inside. So Paul says, focus on the inside because the inside shapes the outside. And then Paul continues in 1 Corinthians because the outside illustrates where you've been focusing. So for instance, we don't typically see uh, Mr. Americas or Captain Universes or whatever they're called. They're amazing to look at. They're not really adding anything that I've ever known to the world of spirituality or theology or decisions of faith. They add a lot to the world of bodybuilding, yay, and they all end up overweight and dead. <laughs> like that's, that's how it goes. Uh, so, you know, Paul is saying focus mostly on the inside because inside shapes the outside but be very disciplined in our outsides because our outsides illustrate what's happening on the inside. Let's not prevent people from making decisions of faith by the, we can say, another way of saying this, it's a plea for integrity. Uh, we can say that we are trying to conform ourselves to the image of Christ, but until our body actually falls in line with our theology, there's, there's, we're not encouraging others in their own decisions of faith. But when we are clearly aligning ourselves with Jesus Christ and conforming ourselves on the inside to the image of Jesus in accordance with the will of the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit, 
and people see it in our behavior, in our bodies, now there's a credibility to our gospel, right? So much so that a famous saint one time said, St. Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel all the time. And you may have heard this quote. If necessary, use words. That the influence of our physical presence, of our actions, of how we behave, even to a certain degree, I guess, how we look, it, it either leads people to investigate the claims that we say are in charge of our life or to dismiss them. And so it, Paul says, the inside shapes the outside and our outside illustrates the inside. So he says, keep it together, discipline our bodies and bring them under strict control so that after preaching to others, Sometimes that involves words, sometimes, and more powerfully, it involves how we behave, how we act, that we ourselves will not be disqualified. So the inside shapes the outside, the outside illustrates the inside, and I wanna take a, a quick segue before I move into the final point. The final point is gonna answer this question. So what is the guiding principle? What is the overarching biblical idea behind the theology of our bodies that will help us make specific decisions of how we treat our bodies. That's where the sermon is going to land. But let me just take a quick side road um, in case there's curiosity or confusion. I'm gonna do a very, very quick summary of what the Bible says, how we are to treat our bodies uh, in, in a couple of critical areas because the Bible directly addresses these certain areas. The Bible is very, very clear that when it comes to our eyes and our ears and our mouths, that we are to be very careful what goes in. Uh, I'm not going to refer to the scriptures, but there's many of them. Long story short, the scripture says that we are to guard our eyes, guard our ears, and be mindful of what we are actually eating or what we are consuming. So content that we take in for our eyes, things that we listen to and things that we eat, we should be very careful about. Uh, Why? Because this is what the scripture says in Luke chapter six, verse 45. What we take in is processed by our inside man, our inside woman, our personal theology, our conforming to Christ or not is influenced by the gates of our eyeballs, the gates of our ears, and to a certain degree, the gates of our mouths, and it comes out from our heart. This is what Jesus says. So be careful what we put in because what we put in influences what comes out. This is what Jesus says uh, in Luke chapter six. And again, I'm sorry, I forgot. My body is failing. If someone could hold my Bible for me in the front row, I could probably see the verse better. There we go. Uh, Wow. Oh, there it is. Oh my gosh. That's distracting. I'm sorry about that. I guess it's also a good illustration that we're decaying. Oh my goodness. A good tree does not produce bad fruit. On the other hand, a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit. Each tree is known by its own fruit. Figs are not gathered from thorn bushes and grapes are not picked from a bramble bush. Here it is. A good man produces good out of the good storeroom of his heart. And here's the verse. An evil man produces evil out of the evil storeroom for his mouth speaks from the overflow of his heart. So what is coming out of our body, specifically what is coming out of our mouths, is a byproduct or the fruit of our hearts. And our hearts are shaped by what we see, what we hear, and to a certain degree, what we consume. So how we talk is a byproduct of our heart. It's the fruit of our lives. And that fruit is nourished by the things that we consume with our eyes and our ears and our mouth. So under the general heading of how do we take care of our bodies, we need to be careful what we eat. There is freedom as a Christian to pretty much eat whatever we want. But Paul also says that not everything we want is good for us. 
So don't be controlled by those who say you should only eat blah, 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 because they're just looking to exert undue influence in your life. However, not everything that you eat is going to be good for you physically. So be careful what you consume. And the same thing goes for our eyes and the same thing goes for our ears. Um, the, the, the thing about wisdom, and, and this is where you know the sermon might pinch a little bit as we talk specifically about what the Bible says in regards to our body, is that we know from last week's sermon that wisdom brings life and peace. And we would say that life and peace are comfortable. Like we like life and peace. Life and peace feel good, more of that. But what wisdom reminds us is that life and peace come by addressing reality, not hiding from it. And that's where the pinch comes in. That's where, because remember the the power of sin is the pleasure. Right? It just feels good viscerally, immediately. It doesn't have anything to do with perceiving reality clearly. It just makes us feel good. That's the power of sin. It feels so good, it's pleasurable. Well, we would also know that life and peace are pleasurable, but life and peace come from addressing reality. And that's where wisdom comes in and that's where the pinch is. That's where it gets a little uncomfortable. So what we consume, Not everything we look at with our eyes is helpful for us. We have the freedom to look at all kinds of things. Not everything we listen to. We have the freedom to listen to all kinds of stuff. If someone tells you that you should only listen to country music, they're obviously wrong, right? That's evil. That's terrible. That is a morally degraded person. We know that. Okay, so I don't like country music. But anyone that tries to manage you by saying you should only be listening to, you know, Christian, if it's not on uh, the Christian radio station, you shouldn't be listening to it. They're actually wrong. We have freedom to listen to all kinds of things. But wisdom says not everything we listen to is going to conform us to the image of Christ. Same with our food choices. So what comes in is what comes out. So the Bible says in general, when it comes to things coming in, be very, very careful. Finally, the Bible also says, by way of practical application, oh, so uh, booze, what does the Bible say about booze? The Bible says that booze has its purpose. It's to comfort those who are grieving. Uh, It absolutely has a relaxing effect. It says that those who are kings or in leadership positions should consider not drinking booze at all for the same reason that we don't want airline pilots. There's an eight hour rule, bottle to throttle, right? And every airline that I'm familiar with says 12 hours bottle of throttle. It's for the same reason you don't want a pilot drinking. It's the same reason you don't want someone who is a king or who is an authority or who is in charge drinking. They need their uh, mental. They, we don't want them in a relaxed state. We want them in an engaged state. So alcohol has its purposes. It is not in, a, in and of itself evil. What is sinful? Drunkenness. Because the Bible says that we are to be controlled by the spirit of God, not by spirits, alcoholic spirits, uh, strong drink. So, you know, specifically food, be careful what you consume. Not everything is healthy for you. Don't get legalistic about it. Don't impose legalism on others. Booze, booze is not evil. Uh, It has its purposes. It's recognized biblically. We know that those in authority need to be very careful with alcohol. Sometimes they just need to not drink at all, depending on their position. And what is actually evil is giving control of our minds and our bodies, uh, becoming a slaves to uh, something that the Lord did not intend for us. So uh, that's, you know, drunkenness, super specific example there. Um, Another way that the Bible is, and the Bible has a lot to say about this, and I'm just going to touch on it very, very briefly. And then I'm going to wrap up our time together this morning with answering the question, what is the overarching guiding principle regarding how we are to use our bodies? What is the thing that we need to have in our mind that will give us 100% clarity with every decision we ever need to make about our bodies? But before I do that, the Bible also says that we are to be extremely mindful of and careful how we share our bodies, okay? This is the home run passage where I'm gonna be wrapping up today's message is in 1 Corinthians chapter six, verses 12 through seven. You can turn there if you'd like right now. Here's what the Bible says about how we share our bodies. I'm just going there real quick. That when it comes to intimacy, the biblical plan, God's will, wisdom says, 
one man, one woman, married, share intimacy. And there's, I mean, books and lots that I could say there. But that is what the Bible defines as how we, if we share our bodies outside of the confines of holy marriage, one man and one woman, that is not the path of wisdom. There is pleasurable, absolutely, everybody gets it, but it is not godly. It is not wise. It is not biblical. It is understandable because sin is pleasurable and that's easy to understand, but it is not the path to life and peace. Life and peace are the path of wisdom. It's the path of looking at reality. And as God defines the reality of how we are to manage our bodies physically and who and how we share them, the Bible is blazingly clear that it is one man, one woman in marriage for intimacy. Lots more that I could say there, uh, but that's, that's quick. And then allow me to show you the passage because it not only illustrates what I just said, but it also gives us the big, it answers the why question. How may we have the wisdom for the rest of our lives to know how we are to manage our bodies? First Corinthians chapter six, beginning in verse 12. Paul writes, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is helpful. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be brought under the control of anything. Double stuff Oreos, booze, um, certain types of music. We're not to be addicted to or slaves to anything, okay? That's what Paul is saying here. Food is for the stomach and stomach for food, but God will do away with both of them. The body is not for sexual immorality, which is sharing our bodies outside of one man, one woman in marriage, but for the Lord. That's not my definition, by the way. That's the Bible's definition. Anything outside of one man, one woman in a marriage is considered sexually immoral. For the Lord and the Lord for the body. God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Don't you know that your bodies are a part of Christ's body? So should I take a part of Christ's body and make it part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? Well, you might be saying, well, okay, that never really happens in real life. Biblically, anyone that is being intimate with someone to whom they're not married is acting as if they are a prostitute. Again, not my definition. That's the biblical definition. It's rough. It's a little pinchy, right? It's completely against our culture and what we hear. But the biblical definition of sexual immorality and prostitution is very, very clear. That's what Paul is talking about here. Do you not know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For scripture says the two will become one flesh. But anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. And then he goes on to say to run from sexual immorality Uh, because of it is not the path of wisdom for those of us who are being conformed to the image of Christ. So it's a little bit hard to see in this passage, but Paul actually says twice in the verses that I just read what the overarching principle is for the guidance of our physical bodies. But because we're so tuned into his teaching about immorality, that sometimes that's the teaching that we focus on and we miss the greater principles that he included here. And with this, I'll be wrapping up our time together this morning. Please note, and again, I apologize, it is almost impossible for me to see the verse references. But here's what he says. Don't you know that your bodies are a part of Christ's body? And then in verse 17, he states, anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. What is the overarching principle that is to guide our decisions about how we treat and train and focus on our bodies? The idea is that we belong to the Lord. That twice in this passage, Paul actually states that our body mysteriously is the same as Christ's body and that anyone who belongs to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. And so the overarching guiding principle regarding how we are to treat our bodies and the priority that we give to them is answered by this principle, which is 
we treat our body as the gift that it is, as if it belongs to the Lord. That it's his body. Yes, we have been given control over it, but we are to understand. So if we're trying to figure out, should I do this or should I not do this? Or how should I, this relationship or this music or this food, anything dealing with our body, the overarching principle that, we, that is to guide us is this here, that anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. That, don't you know that your bodies are a part of Christ's body, that we are to treat our bodies as if they belong to the Lord because they do. By way of conclusion, one thing that I think will be encouraging and helpful to you is you may know from the Old Testament readings and teachings that the nation of Israel was forbidden from a lot of stuff. One of the things that the nation of Israel was forbidden from is that they were to make no, in the words of the King James, graven images. They weren't supposed to make any carvings or idols or statues. They weren't supposed to paint any pictures of God. There was not to be any attempt at showing people what their heavenly father looked like. It was forbidden. And of course, in all the other pagan religions at the time, they celebrated those images. They created those images. They overlaid them in gold. They carved them. There were images of these false gods all over the place. Israel was unique in that they were not to have any physical representation of God at all. Why? Because nothing that is formed by human hands can compare to the beauty and the power that is found in you. The only thing that we know in scripture that is actually created in the image of God is you, us, we, and nothing is to try and represent that. Nothing is to try and, and mimic the glory of that, but the power of God living inside one of his people is the most beautiful, attractive, powerful, visual representation of God that anyone can possibly imagine. Praise the Lord for that. That is how the Lord feels about our bodies. So take care of them. He is living, according to his scripture, inside of us. And nothing can match the beauty of you especially when the Lord is shining through your body because we're walking in wisdom and growing in stature. Would you join me as I pray? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the guidance of your word. And like always, we find things in here that we would have never written or we find wildly culturally inappropriate. And Lord, this morning, because we are defined by you, we are saved by you, we pledge ourselves to you, we are here to say we don't care about that. That we care about your thoughts, we care about your ways, we care about your ideas, we care about life and peace and reality and the wisdom that comes in the fear of the Lord. And so Lord, we are okay with being told things we don't wanna hear. We are okay with having moments where we realize that we need to change to conform ourselves ever increasingly to the image of your son. And for some of this morning, Lord, or someone who is online, maybe this is how we need to be conformed to the image of your son. It is by a decision of faith to become a Christian. And it sounds like this, Heavenly Father, I have never thought about the fact that you live inside your people, that we bear your image. And Lord, I want to bear your image. I want you to live inside my life. I want to humble myself to your guidance. I know that the path of life and peace begins with reality and the reality is I know that I am a sinner and I need to be forgiven. And so by faith, I ask Jesus to be the Lord, the savior of my life and I turn from everything that I know. I have been putting stuff into my body that I should not have been allowing in. And from this moment forward, Lord, I say I will only allow those things into my body that pass your muster first. 
So for some of us, maybe that's the best way to be conformed to the image of Christ this morning and to grow in stature. For the rest of us, Lord, I pray you give us great wisdom as we have a, a fresh appreciation for the blessing that is our physical body and how we may live our lives with wisdom. And we ask, Lord, that you give us the courage to apply this teaching to our lives this week. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me as we wrap up our time together this morning?
are such a handsome bunch. I mean, half of you are in your jammies, but you're a handsome bunch. And I can prove it because we're at a year in pandemic living, and yet here we are gathered to conform ourselves to the image of Christ. That makes us a handsome bunch. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we continue to gather in person and online, that we would be ever, we would grow up in stature, that our inside development as men and women who are following close after your son Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit would be evident in our eyes and in our smile and in our faces and in the way we control our bodies. May you be honored and glorified by your body, which is the church. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, God bless.